great. On today's show, I am excited, really excited to uh, introduce my next guest who has really taken me under his wing, has been a great help, mentor of mine, um, someone who I admire from afar and I always watch every step he's taking. Um, I want to introduce to the show David Meltzer. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, Jordan, it's great to see you. In fact, I'm sad that you say I mentor from afar now because I used to come to New York so much. I, I could mentor you from a close, but this will have to do. I know. I was actually, I was thinking about it. I looked it up today. Um, I forgot the name of the place where we met, but it was like the car club yeah. uh, on the west side near the Javits Center. Thanks to uh, Jake Fleshner. I know he's been working with you for a while now. Uh, made that introduction. That was an awesome conversation. That was right when I started my business. Uh, that's a that's a combo I, I I will never forget. Um, that was a really cool spot too. I must say to take yeah. meetings. Um, but Dave, if if you can, I would love if we can start off. If you can just introduce yourself, you know where you're from originally, um, college, and then kind of take us through your career and where you are today. That would be great. Awesome. I'll combine all of those together. You know, I was born in Akron, Ohio. My dad left when I was five, so I have a single Jewish mom working two jobs as a second grade teacher packing our dinners in a paper bag. My favorite dinner was uh, a bologna sandwich, Oscar Mayer bologna with mustard on Wonder Bread. Uh, and that was a treat for me. It really wasn't punishment in any way, although I lived in a world of not enough, right? I lived in a world where I felt mm -hmm. as, if, as if I was a victim, why other people had so much and I had so little. My mom actually, the second job was filling up turnstiles with greeting cards at convenience stores. And, you know, all I wanted to do was be rich. I wanted to buy my mom a house in a car and retire. I told her at five, I'd make a million dollars, buy her house in a car and never have to work again. Uh, which is just shows you where my mindset was. Yep. And so unlike my siblings, my mom was an educator. So, you know, typical Jewish mom, I joke around, but she was a black belt in the martial arts, uh, the martial art of Jewish guilt. So <laughs> it was doctor, lawyer, doctor, lawyer, of failure, oh, man. you know, fetus Jewish is guilt is the realest thing. Oh, it is. And it's, a, it's what's made our people so strong. Um, yep. And <laughs> all the moms out there are listening and laughing and they're, they have a special club, I think, that they train each other. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, the fetus wasn't fully developed after graduate school. Unlike my siblings who followed that direction, went to the Ivy Leagues, graduated summa cum laude, I wanted to stand out in my family in a way that no one had ever had. So, my family, if you graduated Harvard, like my younger brother, summa cum laude, you were one of many. But if you could wow. start on your high school football team or even play football in college like I did, you were one of the only. If yeah. not, I was the only. And so yeah. I use football as my ability within the six kids in my family and my hundreds of academic cousins to stand out. I went to uh, Occidental College, played football there, and my very first I literally thought I was going to be a professional football player until my first game when I got ran over by Christian <laughs> Koye. And then I lied on my back saying, doctor, lawyer, failure. But I ended up going to law school at Tulane. Uh, and I, and, you know, one advantage, I want to put this out there for a lot of entrepreneurs, one advantage of thinking that money buys love and happiness, one advantage of going only after the dollars is you always keep your options open. You're always looking for something that pays you more, a bigger opportunity. So yeah. even when I went to law school, I graduated, did really well. Uh, I was going to be an oil and gas litigator only because, not because I loved oil and gas or I love law. I, it was the highest paying law job there was. So that's why I did. But here's the funny thing. I also got a job offer to sell legal research in 1992. This is XT computers that you carried around on a luggage cart that uh, had monochrome screens and DOS and 9,600 baud modems dial up service. Talk about slow. But anyway, <laughs> I was going to sell legal research on this, you know, internet. And my, I'll never forget my mom. It's my favorite line she ever gave me. She goes, oh my gosh, if you're not a real lawyer, if you're a salesman, you're going to blow it. This internet thing, it's a fad. It's never going to last. No one's going to do research. You, you need books. No one's going to do research on the internet. Only people can read in books. I'm an educator. I know. I'm like, okay, just because someone loves you doesn't mean they give you good advice. That's what I have to say. So yeah. I took the sales job. Nine months out of law school, I was a millionaire. I bought my mom a house in a car, proving that money buys love and happiness. That was always the case. Everything in my life through my 30s affirmed that the more money I made, the happier and the more love I got from people. Now, 
everybody was telling me yes for an answer. And I, you know, my first company we sold for $3.4 billion in 1995. Incredible. Went to Silicon Valley, learned how to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. By 30, I was married to my dream girl who actually hated me when I was a little boy. I've known her since the fourth grade. So in my mind, money had a factor in that. I owned everything I ever dreamed of, a golf course, a ski mountain, hunt, 33 different homes, you know, Ferrari, Porsche, you name it. If, if I wasn't happy, I'd buy something to make me happy. That was my life. So in essence, I moved from a world of not enough to a world of just enough. So I was buying things I didn't need, different right. things I didn't need to impress people. Even worse, I was buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't even like. And that's a really <laughs> sad thing. But what I learned, you know, I as, I sat there, as I sat there at 30, I got my first warning from my dad that I was on the wrong track. Now, my dad had been an absentee dad for 20 years. He's a deadbeat dad, made a lot of money, never gave child support. But he was my hero until he forgot my birthday at 10 and lied to me and told me he didn't believe in birthdays. So by 30, he now gives me a birthday present and he tell, and I open it up. I'm crying because it fits me. It's a sport coat. I open it up to see if it says, you know, especially made for my son's 30th birthday or something. He had torn the pockets out. I called him. I was in tears so pissed off. I was like, Dad, why are you punishing me after all these years? Why would you send me a gift like this? I can't even wear it. He said, son, it's not for wearing. It's because I love you. You're just like me. Don't, don't think that money buys love or happiness. You can't take anything with you when you're gone. You should be buried in this jacket. Hang it up in your closet. Remind yourself you're not going to be the richest man in the cemetery. Well, at 30, in the position and mindset that I was in, I wasn't ready to hear it. Right. So I told, I told them I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, overseller, back end seller. I hate you. And I hung up. Well, that continued on. I kept on making money. I ended up being a CEO of uh, the world's first smartphone for Samsung. So stayed within technology for a decade, ended right. up at the highest level, a multimillionaire of the second largest manufacturer of phones. I then moved on as a VC, as an angel investor, and met a guy named Lee Steinberg. Uh, most people know Lee from the movie Jerry Maguire, most notable sports agent in the world. Uh, and within 48 hours of meeting him, he offered me a position to be the CEO of that company, changing the trajectory from finance and technology into sports. Right. And uh, that's where I met Warren Moon, the Hall of Fame quarterback, uh, and uh, as I worked for Lee, by the way, my warning from my father was coming true. Uh, <laughs> I'm working for Lee and he hired me, you know, so that I could show financial success. So 75% of multi athletes go bankrupt. I was utilized to tell the parents, hey, we're going to take care of your kid and show them how to maintain their wealth, grow their wealth, give them financial literacy. They use me as kind of that icon of financial success. Meanwhile, uh, you know, I had gone bankrupt. I had lost over a hundred million dollars and learned some valuable lessons uh, mm. along the way. My wife saved my life and in actuality two years earlier, changing my trajectory to move me from what I call the world of just enough when I was buying things I didn't need to impress people I didn't like to this new world of more than enough uh, of everything. And so things come through me for other people, but I'm Warren Moon and I, we spun off 11 years ago, a marketing and media company, uh, that became global four years ago uh, when we kind of met, you know, three and a half, four years ago, yeah. I started building my own brand, um, utilizing all the skills, knowledge and desire that I had for Steve Young and Troy Aikman and Warren Moon, those types of characters. And I started to apply them with the genius of Gary Vaynerchuk uh, to the Dave Meltzer brand. And sure enough, I have, you know, four books, a podcast, I speak around the world, top business coach. I have two TV shows, six seasons of Elevator Pitch, and now <laughs> my biggest show, I executive produce, as my first one by myself. I have a show called Two Minute Drill that's launching on Bloomberg in January and Amazon Prime Video. It's my own show. It's my biggest success, my best project ever. Uh, and so all of those things aggregated. Really, that brand in Bug Light is to simply do one thing, my friend, and that's to empower over a billion people to be happy. Um, and that's why I come on shows like this to empower Jordan, to empower a thousand, to empower a thousand to be happy. And you are. And Dave, I, I really appreciate that breakdown. Very thorough. And what an incredible background you have, um, you know, from, as you mentioned, 
you know, single mother being raised. I was the same way. My dad passed when I was younger to have that strong woman in your life to raise you and your siblings. It, you know, it changed my perspective, um, you know, on the world, especially women in business. Um, and you know, that's one of the many things I want to touch on that you just mentioned. One thing I wanted to call out was, you know, you mentioned that obviously you were going for these high paying jobs in the beginning. And then you transitioned into sports. And as you mentioned earlier, listen, I'm a jock. I love sports. Jewish kid from Long Island, realized probably junior year of high school, I'm going to go to college for academics, probably not sports. Um, so w- when you had that realization, of course, it kind of, you know, it brings you down a little bit. It humbles you. But at the same time, you were able to take, you know, your experience, your education, and then apply it to the thing that you love most as a kid. Um, did you find, you know, not that, you know, you found happiness in many ways, but did you find like that was, um, your first transition to finding that happiness and finding that place where you are today? That is a great question. You know, I'm a little bit different. And I'll tell you why. When I was in the second year of my law school, uh, my oldest brother passed away. The one that taught me to be more interested than interested. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. And it was, it was, uh, one of those things you're too young to realize how much it's affecting you, yeah. especially when you're in law school. But, you know, looking back as well, serious financial problems. Uh, my credit was bad. Uh, I had to let people borrow money and, and it, they didn't pay it back. And whatever happened, I was accountable. Anyway, I was sitting on the edge of my bed going into my third year into a recession. When I applied to Tulane, 100% of the kids had jobs coming out of Tulane. I think the past year during the recession, 17% at Tulane. And that was a good percentage compared to other law schools. And so I was lying on my bed. I remember sitting there and just going, God, if if you can give me enough money to buy my mom a house, buy my mom a car, and pay off my law loans, which was about a hundred grand. If, yeah. if, if you give me that much money out of law school, I will shovel shit with my hands six days a week, 12 hours a day with gratitude, like Victor Frankel, with, with a mindset I had read, you know, in Man in Search of Himself. Uh, I, I thought about Victor Frankel and I, and I meant it. And so what was cool is I had built my life on this philosophy of pain was an indicator, a turn signal, not a stop sign. That suffering was the ability to find or seek the light, the love, and the lessons and everything. And that I never dreamed that I would love what I did. So what I decided to do, like Viktor Frankl teaches, Mm -hmm. is I would learn to love everything I did. I would learn to enjoy the consistent, everyday, persistent, without quit, pursuit of my potential. I could eat fish head soup and dirty water in the Holocaust every day and, and feel joyful about it. I was going to control my mindset of how I thought, the heart set of how I feel, and what I think, say, do, and believe. And I did that from the time I graduated law school. So when I was presented with a sales job that put me into hotel rooms with 25 day per diem and it was easy. by cleaning <laughs> compared to what I had set my mind for, you know, it had been like Victor Frankl preparing himself for the Holocaust and instead he's staying at the Four Seasons, um, you know, everyone catering to him. So <laughs> that, that though I never lost. Right. And so when I got to the position of a dream job of being around the backdrop of sports, giving access to a kid like me or any, like you said, frustrated Jewish athlete that couldn't make it, you know, access to this. <laughs> Many super- of them in this world, I can imagine. <laughs> exactly. And they're commissioners and they're running teams and owning teams. But beyond that, to give them the access to the Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, Masters, Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cup, ESPYs, Emmys, Oscars, Grammys, thousands of golf tournaments, all their heroes. I market the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the Clemente family. It was a dream come true, but yet, no matter how great my life was, I never left the Victor Frankel mindset. All right. I, was, I okay. gave meaning. I kept telling myself, through, even when I lost everything, I told myself, I give meaning to everything I see. And it's a very important lesson. That mindset, for you to be able to grow up with that, is such an advantage over, you know, over the field. It's something that I personally am still trying to figure out. It's the mindset that I used, I would call my grandfather, for example, you know, fought in World War II, Holocaust survivors. They're known as the greatest generation of all time because they literally had nothing and they worked and they worked and they worked back to Jewish morals, you know, and just our upbringing and, you know, our values, um, which, you know, education was obviously one of them and work ethic is another. And, 
I think that is, it's so important. And, you know, I'm trying to develop that and hearing that you had that from the beginning, it's just, you know, is that something that you learn or you saw through your family members, through your grandparents, or did you just develop that on your own? And it's just kind of a God giving gift. I think there's always a combination with these yeah. types of things. One is we're born with a quantum memory. I believe I was born with a quantum memory that if you believe in reincarnation, past lives, I believe I was in the Holocaust. I, I truly believe that I was born with this quantum memory. If you were going to give me, you know, what's your spirit animal? Mine's a mule, right? Because I don't quit. Like I just will walk the mountain. You, you, everyone's better looking than me, more talented, stronger, faster, but they're not going to outlast me. I'm the right. mule. I'm just going to carry the load and keep on carrying the load. And I've done that for years and years. And it's made me into an eagle, even though I'm truly just a mule. You know, everyone admires, you know, the beautiful bird now. Uh, And, you know, I always say they laugh at you, scoff at you, make fun of you. Then they applaud you. You said something funny, though, Jordan, because when I speak around the world back before COVID, I'd start a lot of my speeches saying, you know, hey, I grew up poor, you know, six kids, a single mom. And how many of you out there grew up poor? And invariably half the people raise their hand, right, with nothing. And then I say, oh, I feel sorry for the other half of you. (laughs) I I tell my kids all the time, my biggest failure as a parent is I can't teach you what I learned from watching my grandfather who worked six days, 12 hours a day, sold during the depression, sold tires out of a truck, barely spoke English, and then built his own auto parts store six days a week, 12 hours a day, right? Just, he outworked everyone. People don't mind hard. Here's what I found, Jordan. People don't mind hard. And what they can't stand is the long. They can't stand a long vision, a long journey, a long objective. Where I was going now. I think long. When I met Gary Vee, and I met you about the same time, I met him four Super Bowls ago, he said, so what are you looking to do, Dave? I'd really like to help you. You've been such a great help to our sports agency. I said, I want to have two ambassadors a year. Now, he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, two amb- you know, I want two people like Jordan that's going to tell everyone, you got to follow Dave Meltzer, you got to read his books, you got to listen to his podcast, watch his TV shows, and I need Jordan to tell two people every single year, and they'll tell two people. And yeah. he's like, really? I said, yeah, because – I'm 50 years old when I met Gary. I said, when I'm 70, 20 years from now, I'll be the most popular 70-year-old on social media, just two people, two ambassadors at a time, even if I only get two in one year. And go ahead, understand Einstein's you know, rule of 72 or compound interest that Warren Buffett lives by, accelerate growth and, ex- and exponential growth. That's how you get there, thinking long and working long. Oh, yeah, you, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that you have this long term mindset that, you know, I think I have through my grandparents, again, everything that I've learned. Yes, it's through what I've seen in the business world in my own life own perspective. But a lot of it comes from the core foundation that was built before I even got out there to see these things. Um, was there ever a moment where you felt and I guess maybe when you were making all that money and everything kind of blew up in your face in the sense of where you felt like you were just you turned to short term mindset? And it was just like focused on now versus focus on the next five to 10 years. And I know you mentioned your wife um, yeah. saved your life. And, you know, that's another thing that we could talk about on another podcast. I'll go on it's for hours. The same story real quick. So, yeah. just, you know, uh, two weeks before that incident, just real quick, I invited my best friend, Rob, who I'd known since the fourth grade as well. In fact, he asked my wife to go study for me at sixth grade camp. And she said, no, tell him to ask me himself. And he yelled out in front of everyone, dude, she said no. So I threw an egg at her. So he's the reason that she hated me. Uh, but anyway, I asked Rob to go to the Masters with me and to hang out with McGriff and the Curtis Strange at the cabins and go to the NetJet parties. And he said, no. I said, Rob, wh- why won't you go? He said, I don't like who you hang out with. Mm. And I said, come on, Rob. They're good guys. He goes, it's Augusta, hey, Rob. It's Augusta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and he goes, hey, I don't like uh, what you guys are doing either. I said, Rob, I'm not doing what those guys are doing. He said, Dave, you can lie to me but you can't lie to yourself. So Hmm. this is the moment I went home crying, feeling empty because I knew I'd spent the last decade with everyone telling me yes. And Rob was my only real friend. In fact, my wife and my mom, because I bought my mom a house in a car. My wife had this extraordinary life. They were both afraid to tell me how truthful the fucked up, excuse my language, effed up I am. And then more importantly, I I literally, uh, you know, thought that I was this person. Two weeks later, I lied to my wife. And this is that moment that you're asking about. Yeah. I told her I was going to uh, a, a job, uh, an appointment 
and she had told me not to go to the Grammy Awards with Little John, the rapper, because I wasn't paying attention to work. I wasn't paying attention to my family. And she was so worried about my partying. You know, I was partying so, so much and mm -hmm. living short term, like you right. said, living in the moment, you know, thinking I was rewarding myself. For yeah. all, all that I destroying your body and the health. Everything. And just everything. everything. Family, I came home, friends. Yeah. I came home wasted at 530 in the morning and my wife finally told me the truth. Told me I better take stock in who I was or I'd be dead. Told me she was leaving. Told me, you know, and here's the cool. I literally wasn't ready. I told her, are you kidding me? I was so offended, right? Ego-based emotion. I'm like, mm -hmm. look around you. Look at the nanny, the Ferrari, the Porsche, the motorhome, right. the boat, the plane. What, who do you think you're talking to? I can't believe you're talking to me this way. How, you, you know, how can you not be happy? I'm fine. I go to bed. I wake up in a worse place. I'm going to get divorced. I'm thinking I'm going to take her happiness. I'm going to take all the money. We have three kids under 10, three daughters, in fact. I look over. Guess what? There's that jacket, that jacket in the closet. It's sh it's shining like the movie The Natural. You know the Wonder Boy bat when it's the yep. light. Yep. I <laughs> the light hit it. I, I haven't seen that thing in years, and that's the only thing I see. And I realize at that moment, this is what you're asking. I realize at that moment that I am a liar. I'm a cheater, a back end seller, manipulator, an overseller. I'm my father. I don't hate my father. I hate myself. And I better start listening to my wife and taking stock in who I was, the one that the grandparents and the mom, the, the one that built all of this out of character and gratitude and forgiveness and accountability and inspiration, not the fool that was buying things he didn't need to impress people he didn't like, living in ego. And from that day on, I started my journey 15 years ago, and it just kept enveloping on itself, exponentially growing on itself. Where today I live a very spiritual, um, you know, very spiritual life of more than enough of abundance. Where truly I'm here to give my life away, and that's what I do. Now, one interesting paradox of, of giving: yeah. I always believed the more I gave, I more, the more I received. But I was giving to receive. I was giving as a negotiation, as a right. trade. Now I've shifted my paradigm. I tell people all the time: I receive so I can give. I really, I believe money doesn't buy happiness or love, but it allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things, not the things you don't need, not the things to impress people or people you don't like, but if you buy things like community centers in Africa and you know junior achievement and boys and girls club and big, if you spend your money correctly, you're going to be super happy. So I receive so I can give. I still believe make a lot of money to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that, that's... I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think it's fate, right? You have those moments. Everyone like that I've heard that it's been successful in their careers, they have that aha moment, right? And that was that looking at your dad's um, gift that, and then it, I, I'm sure it brought you straight back to that phone call. You could hear his voice in your head. Um, and it's just, David, it's, it, I admire it, man. Like just to be able to go through all those ups and downs, the volatility of it all, um, it definitely hardens you. But to your point, you know, the women in your life, the people who support you, your family, they're the glue. They're the ones that you need to focus on and always, you know, remember that it, they're number one. And, you know, and then the next thing I want to bring up our, our last topic um, for this podcast is something that we discussed um, on a phone call, I believe last year. Uh, it's something that I've been working on personally. Uh, as I mentioned, I lost my dad when I was a kid. I've lost my grandfather who was my role model and idol stepped in as my father figure this summer. Um, so I've had a couple of dark days and, you know, I realized like, how do I get out of this rut? I got to look within and it's all about self-awareness and self-improvement. So, you know, I would love to discuss more about emotional and mental health. And I know you've read books, you've spoken to top scientists in the world. I know this is something you always go after and probably, um, you know, my, you know, obviously you run your business and you're doing everything, but I'm sure this is probably one of those things that you want to just master and, you know, figure out and get down to the nine. And I would love if you can speak a little bit more on this experience when it started. I'm sure it started throughout, you know, your career, but discuss a little bit more about how it came up and how you continue to master it over these years. Yeah. For me to start looking within, uh, I started thinking about, there's a mathematical equation that I learned over these years. What I started paying attention to and focusing it on and what I gave my intention to 
what I think, say, do, believe, and the unconscious competencies that we discussed earlier, personality traits, characteristics, yep. obsessions, and addictions that your grandparents handed down to you, your great-grandparents as well, and your parents. Uh, once I realize that what I pay attention to and give intention to start equal the coincidences in my life, so all of a sudden I started surrounding myself with the right people and the right ideas. Right. All of a sudden I was around the guys that created the movie The Secret and started learning about the attitude of gratitude. And then I met a woman who taught me how to meditate, you know, and I started getting into data meditation and quantum healing. And then I met, you know, Jack Canfield and Bob Proctor and, you know, uh, you know, just extraordinary Jeepak Chopra. And pretty soon, not only was I reading and learning from these people, but then I became an associate and then a friend of these people. And I today sit on the Transformational Leadership Council. I wrote a book with Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul. I'm the Chief Chancellor of Junior Achievement University with Brian, you know, Tracy and, you know, the, the world's, I do business with, with, uh, you know, one of my favorite, John Asaroff is, is a close friend and a family dude of mine. And what happened was, is that I just started to pay attention and give intention to what I wanted. And then all of these people, and they still do, they keep getting attracted. There's no coincidence that I met you and that you and I, although varying in age, that we have very synergistic and supplementary Absolutely. frequencies that you're just younger than I am. It's like Jake Fleshner who brought us together, yeah. you know, probably one of my best hires, if not the best hire out of a thousand employees that I've had out of college. That is shout out to Jake. <laughs> Shout out to Jake, but Jake attracts people like Jordan and Jordan attracts other people that he has within the context of his network. I got very conscious of the great chain of feeding, which was this. Mm -hmm. And you can, when you have a lot of money, you, you have to learn this because people will do things and say yes to you. But if people feed you, you feed them. So I feed Jake Fleshner, mm -hmm. I feed Jordan Fox, I feed John Asteroff and Bob Proctor and Jack Campbell. Then there's people in your life that don't feed you. And you just let them in varying degrees fall away or be separate from you. And then most importantly, what I learned is the people that bled me, you know, mm -hmm. you, the people. So not only is there variance of allowing people that bleed me to fall away, but if it gets too much conflictual or, or it's a detriment or causes interference, corrosion or void shortages and obstacles in my life, I fire them from my life. That's so important. And, you know, it's so hard, right? It's so hard to have that conversation with that person, whether it's a friend from childhood, um, an old, old colleague. That's something that I'm figuring out as I get older. You know, um, my mom mentioned, you know, at your wedding, you'll have 300, 300 people, 75 friends. Out of those 75 friends, you know, in 10 years from then, how many of them will really still be there? And she said, you can count on one hand. And I thought that was a really humbling moment for me to realize, okay, you know, one, how important are these people in my life? Making sure I make that effort, but also making sure you're receiving the same thing. And that was another lesson I'm sure you learned as a kid that I did. You take care of people who take care of you. And it's just to your point, it's the domino effect. As soon as you pass it on to Jake, he passes it on to me, I pass it on to the next person. And you're just creating good in this world. Um, you know, back to energy and spirits. And that, that's something that I was never a spiritual guy until I started working for Alicia Keys. And once I, that opened me up to this creativity and spiritual world that I just never knew existed within me. Um, obviously knew it, it was out there, but it brought out this side of me that um, to this day, I continue to try to grow and become self-aware about and just teach myself, as I mentioned, with a mental health coach or, you know, things like that. Um, so Dave, we're coming to a close. I want to ask a couple, one last question about, um, for me, this is a really important one for, you know, all my listeners and audience is, you know, obviously on a daily basis, you're nonstop and you just, when you go in on a job, you, you take action and you're going to do your best. Um, but sometimes people need to take a step away whenever they're stressed and anxious. I like to call it your medicine. So for me, my medicine is the basketball court or music or the golf course. Um, would you mind sharing just what is your medicine? I meditate 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. uh, that absolutely is my medicine. I believe in plateauing and growing in my life. Uh, my meditation, my today starts, well, sorry, my tomorrow starts today. So up to my meditation, I have a warm up routine, which is called unwinding at 9 p.m. into sleep. And I know we wanted to get to sleep. But <laughs> we don't have enough. It's okay. The I, next time. Yeah. But ironically, <laughs> that that's 
that's the medicine to me is unwinding into sleep and waking up right into meditation, finding my highest frequency, mm-hmm. using it as a baseline for the day to plateau and grow my life, to expand, accelerate, and ex- you know, truly experience what I want. And so I know uh, there's several things that bring me great pleasure, like family and sports and the Los Angeles Chargers, which is you know my favorite team or the Padres. Sorry, but, I'm a Jets fan. I'm yeah, suffering too. <laughs> I, when I talk to Jets fans, they get me. So uh, more importantly, though, that that truly has been my medicine is the unwinding to sleep to meditation, which is a long period of time. That's awesome. And then I have a game that I play with every guest on my show. We call it Top Three. Um, so I'm going to ask three questions. I'm going to start off your top three comedians. Robin Williams, uh, Eddie Murphy, um, and Billy Crystal. Awesome. And then top three bands or artists? Oh, the Beatles, uh, Bob Marley, and the third one's tough. uh, (laughs) Probably uh, the Eagles. Nice. And then the last question is going to be, because you're a man who travels, top three cities that you've traveled to in the world. That is a tough one. Dubrovnik, Sydney. Uh, yeah, Dubrovnik, Sydney. And I'm going to have to say this is going to kill everyone in Manhattan. <laughs> there you go. And it's coming back. because I look like a New York Jew. Everyone thinks I'm a New York Jew. I know I'm quantum New York Jew. You but I'm are at been... heart. You can't, exactly. you can't take it off. No filter. It is who you, uh, it is who you are, you know, at yeah. the end of the day. And that, I know that myself. So, Dave, thank you so much. I appreciate, honestly, just the vulnerability, opening up, sharing your story so that we all can learn from you. Um, again, I admire from afar. Thank you so much for taking care of me. Shout out to Jake again, and we'll be doing this soon. All right, Dave, stay safe and happy new year. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Thanks so much. Yeah.